Okay. Hi. Can everyone, hi everyone who's joined us for the live stream of Float Down the Coast. Um, why don't I have all of my presenters? You guys can stay muted, but open your come on video so everyone can see your smiling faces and the beautiful backgrounds that we have. Um, and so, hi, welcome. <laughs> I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping before we start the program. So if, cause you guys are joining us live through YouTube, if you're looking at your screen at the top right, there should be a live chat. And I see some people are already finding it. So I can see that we've got Julie with third graders from, um, and we got people from Watsonville. And so we've got Jean Marshall, Bali Lind, we've got some questions coming in. Hi everyone. So feel free to check out that chat. That's how you can communicate with me. Um, and I just wanna let you guys know that whenever a question pops in your head, put it in the chat. We will review the questions at the end. Um, so we won't interrupt any of the presenters through there, but at the end, there'll be some time for some questions to be answered and I'll, I'll assist with that part portion. Um, and if for whatever reason, we aren't able to get to all the questions in the time allotted, I will return back afterwards and your questions will be answered um, afterwards as well. I also want to point out that underneath the description of this video, you'll find a series of links that are already put there for you that are related to what we're going to be talking about today. And then I'll also be adding them into the chat as people are speaking. So just keep an eye out for those. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to start the program. So we're going to say temporarily goodbye to everyone as I get started with our first location. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see this clearly. So I just want to welcome everyone to our float down the coast. We do this every year for Seattle Awareness Week. Today is the fourth day of Seattle Awareness Week, and we're really excited to share some of the unique locations that are significant to the sea otter story. Um, but before we actually begin our float down the coast, I want to recognize that Seattle Awareness Week, it occurs every year during the last full week of September. So you can actually go on your calendar right now and add it for next year. <laughs> and it is organized in partnership with Seattle Savvy, Defenders of Wildlife, California State Parks, Alaka Alliance, Monterey Bay Aquarium. And we of course have many other collaborators that help spread awareness this week. And I forgot to mention, hi, my name is Heather Barrett and I'm the Science Communication Director of Seattle Savvy. And I'm really excited to be the host um, for this event this year. Um, and this year it marks the 20th anniversary and the theme is Path to Coexistence. And we're celebrating the progression towards a positive relationship between people and sea otters. Now this week also highlights Sea Otter Savvy's We Were Here Sea Otter program. And this educates communities and stakeholders that are missing sea otters and offer a survey to communi for community involvement. So the Southern or California Sea Otter Range is currently from Pigeon Point, which is near Año Nuevo State Park in the North to Gaviota State Park in the South. And if you think about that, that's just portion central of California. So that's just a really small segment of their historical range. Now, sea otters did once inhabit all along the Pacific coast. They're ecologically as well as well as culturally significant. And there are increasing discussions regarding possible reintroduction to historical habitats. So to move forward, government agencies and the sea otter research community, we really need to hear from you. We need to engage with stakeholders and hear your perspectives. So if you're wondering what you can do please take the sea otter survey and share your thoughts on possible reintroduction, whether that be concerns, questions, ideas, your voice really does matter in this and we want to hear from you. So the links, the website, all the survey, that's all made available to you um, underneath this video and I'll be adding those um, links into the chat as well. Um, I also wanted to let you know that you can learn more about the sea otter story through our um, digital story map. So that's a, uh, an interactive map that you can go to um, on our website, which I'll share the link to. And it has the significant locations, they're highlighted and the link um, I'll be adding just shortly. So, but without further ado, let's get started with our float. And so we're going to begin our float with Nicola Roche with the U.S. Geological Survey Alaska Science Center and her colleagues who will be speaking from Cook Inlet, Alaska. Here we go. Take it away, Nicole. My name is Laura Geisinger, and I am a grad student.
Someone just told me that it was muted. So we're starting that over. I apologize for everyone. Here's Nicole. My name Nicole. is Laura Geisinger, and I am a grad student at Oregon State University working on my master's in environmental science. Hello, I'm, my name is Karen Robles, and I am an intern at the USGS Alaska Science Center. And I'm Nicole LaRoche, and I'm a biologist at the USGS Alaska Science Center. We're here in Cook Inlet, Alaska. Um, we're in between Nanilchik and Anchor Point on the eastern side of Cook Inlet. And uh, as you can see behind us, um, well, sort of behind us, there's a lot of clouds, but the, uh, the other side of Cook Inlet is part of Lake Clark National Park. So we're here uh, looking at sea otter populations that span actually two different um, management zones. So we've got the, the western stock of uh, Alaska sea otters, that's part of the Aleutian Islands and um, here on the western side of Cook Inlet. And they're actually a threatened population. And then we've got the eastern side of Cook Inlet is part of the uh, south, uh, south central stock sea otters, which goes from uh, Kachemak Bay over to Prince William Sound. There's also a third stock uh, in southeast Alaska, and that goes from Yakutat to uh, Ketchikan in southeast Alaska. But here in Cook Inlet, um, we've got this uh, threatened stock that inhabits the western side of the island, and then we have uh, our uh, Kachemak Bay and um, eastern side otters here that we're looking at today. And we're actually doing uh, several studies here in Cook Inlet. One of the studies is looking at um, the sea otter use in the middle of Cook Inlet that pertains to where oil and gas leases are. And uh, we're very interested in how sea otters are using the area for foraging and also for, um, for uh, mom and pup habitat. And so we're looking at uh, distribution throughout uh, the seasons. And one of the things here is that uh, Cook Inlet gets a lot of sea ice in the winter. So we'll get a lot of ice here along the coastline that sea otters may be avoiding um, and it's uh, harder for them to forage in. So we're trying to figure out if um, the sea ice or any other um, uh, here in Cook Inlet might be affecting the distribution here and why uh, they may not be coming up uh, all the way up north into the inlet as we uh, suspect they should because there's a lot of good sea otter habitat here. Um, so one of the things we do is we're looking at uh, distributions by doing aerial surveys year round, so we'll do seasonal surveys um, uh, and then uh, analyze those and, and try to get distribution and abundance numbers uh, here in Cook Inlet. So my job is to look at aerial surveys that are collected uh, in Prince William Sound particularly, and I digitize and correct these aerial surveys. So while they're in the air, the scientists are collecting the number of adult otters that they see, as well as the number of mom and pop bears, and where in the water they are. So these are all collected on paper maps, and my job is to go in and transfer these into digital maps in GIS, which can then be used for spatial analyses and also for transferring this information so that other scientists can use it. So the end product of my work is to produce formatted data that can then be shared and other people are able to use that data to further their own scientific goals. And my research is focusing in the region of Cook Inlet from Clam Gulch all the way south to just north or just on the north side of Homer. And I am looking at how the sea otters are distributed in that area and how they're using the razor clam beds versus non-razor clam beds. In the northern part of my study area, razor clam beds are prevalent and are really important for sport and subsistence fisheries, but have really declined over the years. And so there has been no fishing of the clams for the last number of years. And so we're trying to understand what role the sea otters have been playing in that. And I'm also just trying to understand how they're using razor clam beds versus non-razor clam beds. So I have six sites total, three in the razor clam area, three in the non-razor clam area. And I'm doing forage data, looking at what the sea otters are eating in each of those sites and in the areas in between. And then I'm also doing scan samples at those six sites where for two hours, every 10 minutes, I am taking a look and counting how many otters are there and noting what kind of behavior they are exhibiting, whether they're foraging or resting, whether it's a mom and a pup, 
Um, so I'm just trying to understand what is going on with the sea otters in this part of Cook Inlet because there is very little known about the sea otters here. So thanks for joining us today. We're going to get back to watching the sea otters eat here in uh, Cook Inlet, Alaska. And thank you guys from Alaska. Um, I will say <laughs> that you can, thank you guys so much for using the chat. There's always gonna be something that goes on in a live stream. So I appreciate you guys being very you know, quick with that. So hopefully everyone was able to hear from them. Um, it is amazing to see how far out those sea otters are. And so that's why using those scopes is a necessary tool to be able to view and collect data on those sea otters. So with that, I'm gonna stop this. And I'm going to now head over, we're headed further south um, to Nickel Creek or Shinyoshi or a little uh, north of that in Northern California with Rosa and Cindy. Um, there you guys are. So let me just pin your screen and take it away. All right, thank you, Heather. Uh, Dalaha, Shihushi Rosa Lauchi. Um, I'm the Marine Division Manager and Marine Biologist for Talawa Dini Nation. Um, I do a lot of monitoring in the intertidal and on shore um, in some of our uh, more culturally important beaches of Talawa territory. Delaha Shikushi Cindy Ford. I'm the Tribal Heritage Preservation Officer for the Talawa Dani Nation. The Talawa homelands lie along the coast of northwestern California and southwestern Oregon. Um, unfortunately, we had an emergency road closure today and the weather is pretty foggy, so please bear with us as we share our special place with you today. <clears throat> we are coming to you from Sturschmet, which is just immediately north of Shinyashri in Talawa Dami country. Today, this place is known as Del Norte County in Northwestern California. The Talawa have lived here on this landscape since time immemorial. Shinyashri is a coastal habitat located in the Smith River Basin. There's a freshwater stream that empties into the ocean, a small protected beach, and immediately offshore of rocky intertidal habitat and kelp beds. The marine life is diverse and rich. The area, while accessible to the public, remains rather isolated and serves as a sanctuary for wildlife. So now I'd like to share with you our Talawa word for sea otter. And I have my little sea otter because we don't have any here. <laughs> so in Talawa, we say Tani Shreini. That is our word for sea otter. Um, Tani Shreini is an integral part of the Talbuk culture, including our stories and songs that we have about them, and is a very special uh, subject for us. And now I'm going to hand it back off to Rosa, who's going to share a little bit about the Talawa history, um, some of the activities on this landscape, and also the potential for the reintroduction of our sea otter to our area. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, yeah, so I'm going to not trip while I do this. Um, <laughs> in this new uh, location that we had to impromptu uh, get to today. Um, there's some interpretive signage um, that I'd like to share with you. Hopefully um, you can read it. If not, I'm just gonna kind of um, read it as well. Um, so this is kind of at the, at the beach um, in Crescent City at Sturschmet. Um, so it talks about community traditions, uh, there are seven large Talawa hamlets that once stood here <clears throat> between here and the Smith River to the north. One of the largest, Shinya Shri, which is our potential reintroduction site, um, was on the banks of nearby Nickel Creek, uh, where the villagers had commanding views of the ocean, their main source of sustenance. Uh, today, there are many Talawa who live on rancherias at Smith River and Elk Valley. Each fall, Talawas gather for ceremonial dances, such as Nadosh, giving thanks for the harvest and for renewing the Earth Mother. So you can kind of see, this is a cultural practice here of drying fish on this beach. Um, so it's just kind of a, a cool little um, thing to share with you um, before kind of going into um, the uh, historical significance of, um, of sea otters here. Um, of course, you know, in the 1700s, the uh, Russian fur trade really wiped out the sea otters. Um, we actually found um, articles from um, November 8, 1854 of sea otters uh, still being harvested at the mouth of the Smith River. Um, so it's, it's 
was definitely a, a prevalent thing up in this area. Um, we've had some anecdotal um, uh, sight, sightings of sea otters up here. There was one um, down in Humboldt, which is south of us um, in like 2015. And then there was a sighting that I heard about um, just north of us in Brookings. Um, so I, it's almost like they're, they're trying to come back. So we, let's, let's help them do that. Um, in the 90s, there was a petition um, to reintroduce sea otters um, in Humboldt County and Curry County, um, but apparently that, you know, didn't go anywhere. So we think kind of right now is the time to revisit that and see uh, what we can do on reintroduction to the area. Um, so the site that we think would be a really good spot is Shinya Shri, which is unfortunately covered in fog right now. Um, <laughs> It would have been glorious to see it, I promise. Um, but like Cindy said, um, it has a really nice um, private beach. Um, there's a couple little um, uh, protected bays. There are offshore kelp forests. There's beautiful rock inner tidal all throughout it. Um, it is uh, owned by state parks, kelp, national. national state parks. Um, so being able to possibly partner with them is something we're looking forward to. Um, and the trail that leads down there uh, is very, it's kind of precarious. It washes out a lot. Um, so you have a lot of trail closures. So we figured that could potentially benefit this site as, um, you know, lessening the human impact that's going to go down there if we do reintroduce them there. Um, <clears throat> so currently we, we're exploring funding options to um, conduct feasibility studies, do some eth ethnological research, um, and uh, with, within our department, uh, Natural Resources, um, our goal is to bring balance back to um, the natural <clears throat> beauty of this place. Um, bring balance back to the oceans, to the coastal areas, to our freshwater areas, um, and all of the monitoring and research that we do absolutely contributes to that. Um, so right now we're actually monitoring a pretty decent um, explosion of urchin population here, um, which would definitely benefit from having some sea otters to munch on them. Um, and then we're also looking into conducting drone surveys of the kelp forest off of our coast. Um, so that will also contribute to that reintroduction plan. Um, so I think that's kind of all we've got for now. It, the, the fog did not lift like we really hoped, but um, you kind of get the idea. Um, so Shushaninla for spending this time with us um, and getting to know a little bit of Talawa territory. Um, hopefully when we do this next time, we'll be able to have secured funding for our Tani Srini reintroduction program. Ashtu. Ashtu. <laughs> Thank you both for, for joining us today and sharing that incredible information. You guys do so much work there and we're so happy to be able to share it. And as they said, as we are, um, having discussions about reintroductions and potential locations. We want to hear from everyone. And so if there's ideas like that you'd like to share, please do take the survey. Um, so thank you, Rosa and Cindy. We are now headed further south to Elkhorn Slough with Seattle Savvy Director Jenna Bental and Defenders of Wildlife California Representative Andy Johnson. And so now let me remove that pin and get you guys on the main screen. There you guys go. Take it away. Hey, everybody. I'm Jenna Bentall with Sea Otter Savvy, and I'm here today in Elkhorn Slough with my buddy Andy Johnson from Hello. Defenders of Wildlife. And I'm actually going to pull our phone in a little bit closer here, and there, you'll see why in just a minute. Um, we were, this, if you've been following our social media on Sea Otter Savvy this week, we talked a little bit about how um, sea otters can be sensitive to sounds. So we don't want to talk much louder than this. And we're also upwind from this raft that I'm going to show you in just a minute. Um, so we want to make sure that um, they're not catching our scent. So that's why I'm pulling this in. We're not going to talk any louder than you hear us talking right now. And I'm going to go ahead and flip this around. So you can get a view. Before I zoom in on our favorite subject today, I just want to give you a look around. This is an estuary 
and this is a, a tidal area. It's a habitat that's very much uh, regulated and depended on the coming and going of tides. And it's an estuary is an interface between freshwater sources coming from inland and seawater and Elkhorn Slough connects to the sea right at the heart of Monterey Bay. So you can see Highway 1 there behind me and just beyond Highway 1 is the entrance to Monterey Bay. This is an incredible habitat with abundant wildlife of all kinds. We've been having birds. You might be able to hear some of the terns um, squeaking around us as we're, as we're talking. Lots of birds, uh, harbor seals, and of course, sea otters. And I'm just gonna zoom in, try to zoom in. So Heather, I can't, um, I can't go to my screen apparently. So I'm not gonna be able to zoom in on the otters, um, but hopefully you guys can see them there in the background. And we are at a distance um, that you really wouldn't wanna get much closer uh, than So about a little, maybe a little over five kayak lengths. And we've been watching this raft um, of about six form uh, as the tide has been going out. We're just starting to see uh, the eel grass exposed as the tide gets lower. So these guys are just resting and grooming and you can actually go right over to a viewing platform on the shore um, and watch these guys without running any risk of, of disturbing them. So it's a really incredible um, place and great spot for viewing sea otters. And while you guys are watching them, um, I'm gonna turn the story over to Andy, who's going to tell you a little bit about the history of sea otters uh, here in Elkhorn Slough. Andy? Yes. Um, well, Elkhorn Slough, as Janice said, is a, just a remarkable spot. You really need to come out, out here and see it for yourself. Um, sea otters started moving back into Elkhorn Slough in the 1980s. And uh, through the 1990s, we would just see you know, groups of males sort of close to the harbor area, they wouldn't move too far into, into the uh, back areas of Elkhorn Slough. And then they kind of disappeared for a while. And um, the, the slough was was not maybe not, not as healthy as it is today. And uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium started a program of rearing uh, stranded sea otter pups using surrogate females, females at the aquarium, who would raise these pups and then they could be released to the wild. And they selected Elkhorn Slough as a good release site because it's, you know, there was good food here, there were otters here, and, um, and it's very well protected. And over the course of 15 to 18 years, uh, the aquarium released over 40 sea otters here. And, um, and those animals succeeded, they stayed here, they reproduced. And what we saw was that, that this area had probably been missing an important top predator. And so the otters were able to keep a lot of the invertebrate prey in check. And we started to see uh, the regrowth of eelgrass, um, better uh, or less erosion along the shoreline. Um, so sea otters are sort of doing the same thing uh, ecologically that they do out in the kelp forests. They just have a profound effect on these habitats and how the system is much healthier. And that sort of ties into what you've already heard about, where everyone's thinking about how can we get sea otters back to their areas where they were historically. Um, we know that in San Francisco Bay, there are, there are probably thousands of sea otters that lived there before the fur trade. And we're hoping that uh, we can find some areas that would be appropriate to release some sea otters and maybe see them have the same effects they're having here in Elkhorn Slough. So I'll stop there for a moment, turn it back to Jenna. And, uh, keep watching. Yeah, thanks, Andy. So I wanted to remind everybody that this year's theme of Sea Otter Awareness Week is Path to Coexistence, and Elkhorn Slough, Moss Landing, Monterey Bay is really a key. That is really a key concept here when we essentially have urban populations of sea otters, sea otters that are living right next to human development, um, human places that are really popular with people for marine recreation activities. Andy and I are sitting here today in our kayaks um, and this is a very, very popular place for kayakers to come. Uh, it's kind of surprising right now, if I were to pan around, it looks completely empty and like we're the only kayakers here, here. Um, but it was quite busy this morning, um, right as the first a groups of kayakers and some school groups came out. And so it's really important that we work with the uh, local businesses, the rental shops, eco-tour companies to make sure they're educating 
their customers, their um, renters on the appropriate etiquette when um, paddling around sea otters. And it's not just the recreationists, right? We have the highway right here with all the traffic going by. So, oh, we have a fodder right there. Swimming towards the group, probably gonna join the raft, maybe still foraging, getting clams. And you can see in the background, um, those are the stacks from the Moss Landing power plant. And many of you probably heard, uh, there was a fire there yesterday, which shut down a good chunk of highway one for all of the day and caused a shelter in place order for this whole area. And just keep in mind, you know, we, these otters are living next to human developments and they aren't given a shelter in place order. They can't be evacuated. Um, they have to live here. This is their home. And so, um, you know, when coming to Elkhorn Slough or any other place where sea otters happen to be, just keep in mind, you know, how if you had visitors to your home, how would you want them to behave? And coming here to, to visit sea otters in a place like this is, is and other wildlife is really a privilege. And we have to exert some um, restraint in our behavior and treat it respectfully so that uh, the animals can continue to be wild and thrive and, and uh, flourish in these places. And they're present here for future generations to enjoy. So I'll flip us back around. Oops. Just back around. Here we are. Um, Andy, do you have anything else you want to add? I don't think so. It's just a great day. We've got uh, pelicans feeding. We've got elegant terns flying around in huge, huge mobs, and uh, it's pretty spectacular. So we'll come out here someday. Yeah, and just if you if you plan a trip to come out here, just uh, check our website, and especially if you're going to rent a kayak or go on an eco tour, look at our um, get certified page, and you can see a list of all the businesses that we can guarantee are going to be sea otter savvy and friendly, respectful to the wildlife. And so if you patronize um, businesses like that, then you really are supporting um, that level of stewardship in this environment. So that's all we have from Elkhorn Slough. Thank you guys so much for literally floating on the water for float down the coast and for giving us that excellent information. Um, I, I think that that point to make of that area really represents a path to co is, is really coexisting right now. And we constantly work towards that. And I'll be adding in um, those links that Jenna just mentioned to the chat in just a moment. But we are now headed um, just a little bit further south to Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and we are going to talk with Allie and Caitlin, and they're going to be giving us an insider view to the Aquarium Seattle program and research. And just hold on one moment while I pin you guys. There you go. Take it away. And I'm Allie. So the Monterey Bay Aquarium is located on the Monterey Peninsula, which primarily is made up of kelp forest habitats and is home to about 500 southern sea otters. Apologies, guys. I'm just going to come in. Um, I can't hear you, um, Caitlin, very well. I don't know if maybe you could speak a little closer or it's just it seems that Ali's mic's working, but yours isn't. No, not really, which is unusual. Oh, but when you get closer to her, you can. Maybe it's just because it's on her one side. <laughs> a little bit better. <laughs> is, um, is yours all? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe you guys can pass one and then pass it back. Thank you guys. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> no, you're fine. Yeah. I'll just, so to help recover the California star and southern sea otter populations, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has been rescuing, treating, and releasing southern sea otters since 1984. In that time, with the help of our staff and volunteers, we have taken in over 900 otters, and we have seen the populations more than double in the wild, which has helped um, improve the ecosystem health here along the Central Coast. So um, in collaboration with other organizations that are trained, we actually rescue Southern sea otters all along their current range. Uh, so usually what that looks like is a phone call. 
So we get a phone call from a member of the public um, when they see a sea otter in need. Um, and it's really important that if you see a sea otter in need that you give that otter its space. Um, sea otters can be extremely dangerous to handle. So it's really important to wait for the trained professionals with the proper safety equipment. And some of that safety equipment we use are actually these Kevlar gloves that Caitlin's gonna put on for us now. And this is actually a bulletproof material. So that's why it's really important that you kind of hang back and let people come in um, that can do it safely. Uh, because like I said, these are wild animals that can be dangerous. Thank you. Otters come into our care for a variety of reasons. So our day to day can look a little bit different depending on the needs of the otters that we have in our care. But every single day will consist of some basic animal husbandries like prepping feeds, a lot of cleaning and then also um, feeding the otters. And so we want to make sure that the otters in our care remain wild. So whenever we're doing something positive with them, like feeding them, we're going to put on a disguise. Allie's going to nicely model this for us. Um, so everybody can kind of see what we wear. It just consists of a black poncho that's covering up our bodies and then also a welder shield that will cover our faces. This is most important because we don't want the otters to become imprinted on or habituated. And so that will help with a more successful release in the future for them. So a large number of the cases that we bring into our care are orphan sea otter pups. So these are pups that would normally still be dependent on their mothers in the wild, but they were separated from their mom too young. So when these very young pups come into our care, they can still need quite a bit of human caretaking. Um, so if we have cases like that, we could be spending a lot of our time maybe bottle feeding them. We might be grooming their very important coat using different brushes, different towels. Um, we're also gonna introduce them to different solid food items, um, as well as helping them hit certain developmental milestones. So some of those developmental milestones we'll be encouraging them to hit might be uh, manipulating objects, which then can translate to manipulating prey items the road. It might be that encouraging them to start to learn to dive, um, as well as helping them become more proficient in grooming themselves. Yeah, and then once the otters are old enough, we will pair them with a surrogate mom. And that's something that makes our program so unique here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, in 2001, we started using our non-releasable resident sea otters as surrogate moms for our pups. And the pups are the moms will teach them a vital skills that they'll need to be successful out in the wild. This can include how to forage on different prey items and how to crack open those hard shell foods, how to groom effectively and maintain their coat condition, which is very important to their survival, and then also how to socialize with other otters that they may come in contact with. So once these otter pups reach a certain age, we actually feed them from their surrogate mom. And then at that point, they're gonna spend some time in a tank with similarly aged otters, just refining those skills that they're gonna to need to be successful out in the wild. And then before we release the otters, we actually give them all two forms of identification, one of which are these flipper tags that you see here. So each um, otter that we release is actually gonna get an individual combination of these flipper tags that's specific to them. So that way, when we see them in the wild, you know exactly what otter we're looking at. Now, when we release otters into the wild, we don't just kind of say like, see you later, we actually spend a good amount of time extensively tracking them to make sure that they're successful. So what we're looking for is we're looking for them to be foraging successfully. So we want to see that they're consistently finding high value diet items that are going to give them the power they need. We're also, we want to see that they are maintaining their coat condition, that they're grooming effectively. And then uh, the other thing we're looking for is how they're interacting. So are they interacting appropriately with other sea otters? And we want to make sure they're not interacting inappropriately humans. So it's really important if you see an otter with one of these tags on them, especially, or any otter, to give them their space because they might be a naive otter just trying to figure out how uh, how to, to be a wild otter again. Um, so right now, we actually have a pretty full house. So we have otters in all different stages of the rehabilitation process, and they're just waiting to get ready for release. Wow. Thank you guys so much for all of that excellent information and really to give us an insider view of what you guys do there. Um, and I love 
showing the fact that you have to wear Kevlar gloves, <laughs> right? Sea otters yeah. are weasels and they definitely have some attitudes and they can be dangerous. And so that's an important fact for people to remember, um, as well as making sure to show those tags, right? So I think a lot of people ask us that when there is photography or something like that, that they see online is there's something on their flipper. And now you guys know that that means that individual is being actively looked at, you know, constantly going back and spotting for them and looking and see, see how they're doing through that aquarium program. So thank you guys so much. Um, I'm going to remove your pin here. And now we are headed a little bit further south to Point Lobo State Park with Alec Knapp, who's an interpreter with California State Parks. Hi, Alec. I'm going to pin you. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Heather. Thanks so much. And welcome everyone to Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. Uh, Ms. Heather said, my name is Alec and I work here at Point Lobos uh, for California State Parks as an interpreter, which essentially is a ranger who does education. So my job is to educate people about this awesome place. Uh, you can kind of see some water around me. So I'll go ahead and show you what I'm looking at right now by flipping my camera around. Um, so this is the view that I currently have uh, out here on the water, just like our friends at Elkhorn Slough in Moss Landing, I too am in some prime sea otter habitat. Um, unlike the estuary that they are at, um, the muddy estuary known as a slough, uh, this is the kelp forest. So our friends at the aquarium were talking about Monterey having uh, so much kelp forest habitat. And you can kind of see some of that kelp forest right in front of me here. Um, and this is uh, another example of a place that sea otters live. And I wanted to go a little bit into, um, of course, this habitat that we're at, but a little bit more into the sea otter history. Now, this year's theme is a path to coexistence. And so a lot of us are aware, but I thought it might be useful to really go back in time and investigate the human history of Point Lobos and the people who have been here for 10,000 years since time immemorial and sea otters. So uh, the Rumsen Ohlone peoples who have been in this area, as I said, for at least 10,000 years, they have interacted with sea otters for a very long time. They hunted them for their warm furs. And as we know, sea otters have the warmest fur in the animal kingdom. That's, that's the human draw to them, to stay warm. Uh, before we had feeding systems um, and puffy down jackets, uh, there were sea otter furs for peoples living on the coast. And they hunted them uh, for subsistence. So they weren't trying to make an industry out of it. They weren't trying to make a lot of cash off sea otters. They were simply trying to stay warm over the winter. So they kept a balance with the sea otters here and allowed the sea otters to live as they would and the peoples lived as they would and without any uh, imbalances. So they had a form of coexistence. Fast forward to the 1700s, the Europeans come onto the scene. Spanish, Portuguese, English, Russians, and of course the Americans, Mexicans, and even hired on Alaskan natives come down to the Monterey area to hunt sea otters. And it was so successful that they called this the California fur rush. So many of us are familiar, of course, with the California gold rush around 1849, the gold miners. Well, there was a fur rush before that. And there was a reason for that. The, the fur hunters called it, uh, they called sea otter furs um, soft gold because of how much they were worth. Well, how much were those sea otter furs worth? Talk to the person next to you and, and take a guess. How much do you think one sea otter fur was worth back then? And if you're not with anyone, just think about it yourself. Well, in 1915, there's an article in the Monterey Daily Cypress, a local newspaper, um, four years after the sea otter trade ended, talking about the sea otter trade. And they said, the skins of sea otters are worth $700 or $800. Now, in 2022 money, folks, that's sixteen dollars or $17,000 per sea otter fur. That's a lot of cash. You can see the draw of people to go hunt for sea otters. But of course, everything has its cost. And hunting sea otter furs aside from the great value that these hunters could immediately get in trading, uh, it eventually created an imbalance in this ecosystem. And what we started to see was all this kelp around disappear. And that's because our sea otters are what we call a keystone species. They keep this ecosystem in balance by eating some of the things that eat this kelp here. 
So one example of something that eats kelp is something known as the abalone. This is a red abalone shell here. Um, abalone are well known uh, for their shiny iridescent shells of purples, blues, and greens. It's beautiful to look at. Um, but abalone and purple sea urchins feast on our giant kelp. And once the sea otters disappeared, these took over. The abalone and the urchins came onto the scene and they just took over this entire kelp forest. And uh, the kelp forest is not only important for sea otters and abalone and urchins, but it's home, it's habitat, it's food for over a thousand different creatures in the ocean. So the kelp forest is a major, major habitat. And I wanted to show you all uh, a couple photos here of one where you can find our sea otters here at Point Lobos. And also what it would be like to see underwater in the kelp forest. So I'm gonna share my screen here. It might take a sec. So the first image that I'm gonna put up here is where if you're coming to Point Lobos, you can find sea otters typically. It depends on the day, uh, but there are about a hundred sea otters here at Point Lobos living year round. So this whole map here is Point Lobos. I'm in Whaler's Cove, which is in the upper right. I zoom in there. So Whaler's Cove is where I'm currently floating. And there's a lot of kelp forests all along the ocean borders of Point Lobos, but where I marked up the map with these uh, yellow markers, that's where you can typically find a whole lot of sea otters. So out at Sea Lion Point, where I have the circle, and then all along the South Shore uh, is where you can find plenty of sea otters, but it does depend on the day. Um, and I want to show you what it would look like if you were to go underwater in a kelp forest. And this is if you were to just drop a camera right underneath my kayak, about 20 feet, this is what you would see. And it really is a forest, an underwater forest uh, that's home and habitat, food for over a thousand different creatures, including our beloved sea otter. And I also want to show you some pictures of sea otters we have at Point Lobos here, because um, I don't see any near me right now. So it's hard to see, but this is a sea otter mom and her pup. The pup is hanging out right on top of the mom's belly. And the mom was probably grooming the sea otter. That's what they spend a lot of time doing so they, they can keep their fur coats waterproof. Here is a sea otter tasting uh, a nice, a pretty full snack. That's a, that's a crab leg right there. Um, so sea otters do eat well, that's for sure. And all these photos, by the way, are taken by our awesome Point Lobos docents, our volunteer docents. Um, sea otters are members of the weasel family, as Heather said, so you will see them on land. Um, here's a sea otter on top of a rock, call that being hauled out. They're just hanging out next to the gull. And sea otters sometimes do walk around. So that's a sea otter on all four, kind of a rare sight for sure, because most of the time we see them floating in the ocean but here's one walking around, pretty cute. And sea otters like to have fun. I, I think sea otters are a lot like human beings. So here's a couple sea otters in the surf, catching some sweet waves. So there's a couple of photos I wanted to share with you of our sea otters. Now you come, can come to Point Lobos year round. It is a California state park. So it's a place that you can enjoy sea otters from a distance and actually at our info station, uh, here where docents give people uh, advice on places to look and, and things to do. You can uh, actually borrow some binoculars so you can see these, uh, these sea otters from a distance. Remember, if a sea otter is making eye contact with you, it's aware of you, it's concerned, and it's on alert. And that uses up a lot of unnecessary energy. They already have enough to worry about in their lives. For more information on a Point Lobos visit, you can visit pointlobos.org. And uh, yeah, love to see you out here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Alec. That is excellent information. And I agree. You bringing your um, binoculars with you if you go to Point Lobos and maybe you'll be able to see some sea otters hauled out on the rocks. And that is a lot of people don't realize that they do need to call out sometimes. It's a good way for them to um, get warmed up and, and not lose as much energy in that cold water. So thank you so much for joining us today. And now we are headed over a hundred miles further south to Morro Bay, where we'll have Libby Shedding, another California state park interpreter who may or may not have a raft near her. We're gonna find out. So let me get her pinned on. Oh, there you are, Libby. Hi. 
Hi, Heather. All right, well, once again, my name is Libby and I'm an interpreter for California State Parks. And thank you so much for joining me here in Morro Bay. It's a beautiful day out today, a bit windy. Um, if you're familiar with Morro Bay, directly in front of me is the iconic Morro Rock. And behind me here, you see the entrance to the harbor and the Morro Bay Estuary. So like Elkhorn Slough, Morro Bay Estuary is a mix of salty water from the ocean and fresh water coming in from creeks. Now, normally we might see a raft of otters right off the rocks here, but today they've dispersed and they are out foraging. But I am going to flip my camera around and we'll keep our eyes out for some sea otters, but I'll give you a better view of Morro Bay here. So like I said, normally we do have a raft of otters that usually is right here off the rocks, just really close to land. We can see up to 20 to 30 individuals at times, but we do find otters further on into the harbor and into the estuary. And as Alec explained earlier, the otters are a keystone species and a really integral part of that estuary ecosystem. So a little history of otters here in Morro Bay, like elsewhere in California, they were hunted and eliminated from this area. And even up until 2010, there were less than 10 otters that called Morro Bay home. So now our latest count, which I believe was just last week, we have a population of 55 otters. So that's 48 adults currently and seven pups. So I think Morro Bay is a great example of a recovery success story. So a really, really thriving otter population that has recovered here in Morro Bay. Now Morro Bay is a great home for otters. As you can see, the water is pretty calm here. It's a bit windy, so we see some little waves, but this sand spit here in front of me is protecting and creating the bay uh, protecting it from the big ocean waves. So this is a nice, peaceful, calm spot for otters to rest and raise their young. We also have areas that are great for foraging for all those favorite foods. Right off the rocks here, we do have a kelp forest. And further on in the estuary, there are plenty of eelgrass beds. So a lot of their preferred food items live in those kelp forest or eelgrass ecosystems. Now, although Morro Bay is a great habitat for otters, it does present some challenges. And I'm going to pan over to the land side here to get a little view of how close we are to the otters. Now, this raft that forms here off the rocks, they position themselves pretty much at the narrowest part of the harbor entrance here. And that's because it's where the kelp forest is located but it's also a really active spot. So a lot of activity on the water here. We see large vessels, large fishing vessels, Coast Guard vessels coming in and out, but also a lot of smaller boats. We have kayakers and paddle boarders who are often trying to get a closer look at the otters. And this area with the kelp forest is also a prime diving spot, really popular with divers. So a lot of activity on the water, but what really makes Morro Bay unique is how close here on land you can get to otters. So you can see where I'm standing here. Often the raft is located right in this area. So this is an extremely busy area. Thousands of visitors come to Morro Rock every year. So lots of people, lots of cars, lots of traffic noise, and we often see people with dogs often coming right down to the water's edge, barking, lots of land activity. So a really unique spot to do some visiting and to spot some otters, but it is a hot spot for disturbance. Uh oh, Libby, I think, um, I don't know if it's just for me, but I can't hear you anymore. Oh, 
How about now? Oh, now I can hear you. Got you back. All right. So as I was saying, there is a volunteer program here in Morro Bay called Sea Life Stewards going on its eighth year. And it is functional from May to October, which is usually our busy tour tourism season here in Morro Bay. And this is a group of really dedicated and passionate individuals that we like to refer to as our on water naturalists. So these folks are out in kayaks, they're on paddle boards, and sometimes even here on the land. And they are really educating people about all the amazing things we have here in Morro Bay, like our otter population. Uh, but they're also really serving to educate uh, people about what a disturbance to an otter looks like and how to prevent that. So a really great program that's helping keeping our otter population healthy. So if you're here in Morro Bay, I really encourage you to come out here and do some otter viewing. It's a really unique experience how close we can get here on land. But I think if we remember to act responsibly and respectfully, we can keep Morro Bay's otter population thriving and healthy. So thank you everyone for joining me here in Morro Bay today. Thank you so much, Libby, and an excellent point that is a great viewing station. And if you go there, just remember to be respectful, keep your voices down. Um, in some of those areas, it's a nursery site. And so um, hopefully you guys are able to take a visit there one day and, and visit Libby at, at The Rock. Um, so we are now headed to our final location, which is extra special. We are headed to the Channel Islands off the coast of Southern California to San Nicolas. It's also known as Island of the Blue Dolphins to hear a special broadcast from our friend Joe Tomlioni, a sea otter biologist with USGS. So I am going to share. Here's Joe. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Tomlioni, and I'm a biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Western Ecological Research Center. I'm joining you today from Flat Rock off the east end of San Nicolas Island, an island with a long and storied history when it comes to the southern sea otter. This island was first made famous to the public around 1960 with the publication of the children's book, The Island of the Blue Dolphins, still read in many California elementary schools today. From afar, the island may look a bit desolate and brown, but it's actually teeming with life and hosts an incredible biomass of marine mammals especially. The entire perimeter of the island is essentially one big haul out for California sea lions, northern elephant seals, and harbor seals. There's a whole host of seabirds that call San Nick home as well. And in the subtitle, we have an incredible species assemblage that includes some of the smallest organisms in the ocean, like nudibranchs and sea slugs, all the way to the largest animals to ever live on Earth, like whales, like the blue whale I saw just off the south coast of the island last week. But of course, we're out here because there's also sea otters out here. The southernmost sea otters in the entire state occur at San Nicolas Island. Now, historically, sea otters were at San Nicolas Island and probably in great numbers. But during the maritime fur trade, they were wiped out from the island and hunted to local extinction around 1850. And the island lacked its apex predator and nursery ecosystems for more than 100 years until otters were translocated from the central coast of California out to San Nicolas Island in the late 1980s and early 1990s. This translocation was done in part to protect the southern sea otter subspecies from becoming extinct in the event of a catastrophic oil spill off the central coast. So moving otters to San Nicolas sort of established a reserve population where the genetic lineage could live on in the event of such a catastrophe. Now, we've been monitoring the sea otters since they were moved out here, and we've also been monitoring the ecosystem since before the otters and debris were moved to San Nick. This is more than 30, or in some cases, 40 years of long-term monitoring data, keeping an eye on the population status of the otters here at the island, but also monitoring changes in the subtidal ecosystem via dive surveys and the intertidal ecosystem via shore-based intertidal surveys. And what we've seen over the years is that we have a growing population of sea otters out here at San Nick, and it's growing faster today than it was in the early years of the translocation. And as the population, which numbers over 100 animals, continues to grow, they're also expanding their usage of the island to use the entire island rather than just the west end of the island 
as they historically have done. We collect a wide variety of data during our sea otter surveys, but one of the things we are pay particular attention to is foraging data. Foraging data can tell us a lot about sea otter's population status, and it can also tell us a lot about the status of the subtitle communities below the waves. Out of San Nicolas Island, the sea otters are largely really big animals, healthy animals, some of the most robust animals we see in California. And as a result, it's not surprising that you see them eating really high quality prey items out here at San Nicolas. It's a lot of red sea urchins, really big purple urchins, occasionally a lobster or an octopus or something like that. These are things that are probably the best thing you could eat if you're a sea otter. So most of the otters out here are eating the same four or five things for the most part, and they're largely ignoring the lower quality prey items like mussels or small snails that we see sea otters eating a lot of back on the central coast where they exist in high density or have been for a long period of time. So that uh, concludes my update, and thanks for tuning in today to learn a little bit about sea otters out of San Nicolas. Thank you so much, Joe. We, I just, it's a very unique opportunity to feature San Nick, and we really do thank you, SGS, for um, having this broadcast with us today. But before you guys hop off, I know we're reaching that sort of one hour mark. I just wanted to um, catch you and, and do one sort of more post for this is that our, our float is complete from those locations. Um, and we do have some questions that will be open and we're gonna bring everyone back in to answer those. But I'd like to share one final reminder for the stakeholder survey. Um, sea otters, like other fish and wildlife populations in the United States, are held in public trust, and this means the government is managing and protecting these resources to benefit the public, you guys. So those discussing potential sea otter reintroduction to historical habitats, some like the areas we saw today with Rosa and Cindy, we need to hear from you. All of your voices and your opinions matter. We want the concerns, the questions, the ideas. So please take the survey, follow us at Sea Otter Savvy for more information. The links are all available under this video. I believe I've added them to um, the chat as well. Um, and we also just want to thank all of those that participate um, during this float down the coast. And, and if you're interested in future programs of Seattle Awareness Week and Seattle Savvy, we always welcome your support. So with that, I'm going to stop my share. And I would like to welcome all of the my presenters to come back on. And I have some great questions that came in. We had a lot of engagement um, today through uh, the YouTube Live. And the first one I want to get to, because I'm worried that they might have to leave if they haven't already, <laughs> is we had a third grade class from MSD school in Watsonville. And um, so let's all wave to say hi to the students in third grade. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, and they wanted to know, um, they're wondering if sea otters bite or are aggressive. And I'm wondering if maybe those at the aquarium would like to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely answer that question. So uh, sea otters, they are wild animals, and as cute as they appear, they actually can be extremely aggressive. If you find otters of all ages, all sizes, you bite me, or you can special things to put them with handling any otter that comes from our deer or death or in the grass you out in the as well. So uh, again, these Kevlar gloves we showed you earlier, we're wearing these uh, all the time when we're handling otters, um, and that is just to keep us safe and protected. Um, we still have to be extremely careful with me and we can still get injured if we're not careful. That's a very good point. And I'm just going to reiterate some of that because it kind of was going in and out. So to reiterate what they said to the students is that, yes, sea otters can be dangerous. They have a very strong bite. And so they have to use those special gloves, but they still could be injured even with those gloves. So it's why it's very important to keep your distance, respect sea otters, keep your distance. Thank you, guys. OK, our next question um, that came in is how many otters are in Elkhorn Slough and a little bit of the history of that. And I'm wondering if maybe I could hop to Jenna and Andy in Elkhorn Slough to answer the elkhorn slew question yeah can you hear me am i unmuted yep i can hear you awesome hi everybody um we're back again <laughs> i think i'm gonna turn that question over to andy i don't know <laughs> um, yeah i think uh th there have been at any one time just you know animals sometimes there were none but as we started reintroducing animals into elkhorn slew we saw the numbers go over 100 animals and uh, a lot of those are mothers with pups it used to be all males here so it's great to see that the animals are getting back in the slough using all the areas, uh, the discrete areas and um, uh, reproducing. It's really uh, kind of made, had a, a mating pair pass behind <laughs> us a second ago. So. Oh, 
Well, that's exciting. Um, and just to, to go on that, when what were these sort of years? When did that start reintroducing sea otters back into Elkhorn Slough? In the, the early 2000s. Okay. And over, that was really uh, sort of an experimental um, concept. And uh, over the period of about 15 to 18 years, um, just following these animals as they were released, tracking them intensively uh, every day of the week, um, and uh, just watching what they did and seeing how they integrated into the wild population. Really pretty extraordinary. And as I mentioned, they've had a big impact on the, the health of the ecology here. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, so I have a question. How is the kelp die-off along the California coast impacting the sea otter habitat? And so I'm wondering if there's someone who would like to raise their hand and answer that question, or if someone want to be the one to jump on the answering of that, maybe Jenna. Uh, I was going to suggest Joe, but he's on video. <laughs> I know Joe's on video. Sorry guys, because he's so, that was a special podcast. <laughs> uh, there's no internet on Sand Nick. So um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of complicated. So I'll try to try to boil it down into, into a quick sound bite. And there are some resources that we could probably direct you to, um, to learn more about it in detail. But um, basically the loss of the, the sea stars due to sea star wasting uh, created an imbalance, even though sea otters were here um, and probably and definitely eating some urchins. Uh, when the sea stars died off, we, it was really at that time that I think um, scientists understood how much of an impact the sea stars like this big sunflower star had on urchin populations. And so sometimes it takes big things, catastrophes like this before we really understand ecology. We think we know what's going on, but we really, you know, we really can be surprised at every turn. And so um, sea otters have had a little bit of a time lag sort of adapting to that abundance of urchins. Um, and, but what the research does seem to indicate is that uh, they did, sea otters did eventually start focusing heavily on urchins as prey um, and eating around the edges of these little pockets of urchin barrens that were forming in the kelp. So there would be a pocket, sort of a, a mosaic, which was the theme of our um, Seattle Awareness Week last year, where you would have urchin barrens, but they were surrounded by kelp habitat. And that was probably in part at least mediated by the sea otters eating around the edges of, of those barrens and preventing them from spreading further like they have in areas where there are no sea otters in Northern California. So the barrens just completely take over. They don't, they aren't mediated by predation uh, by otters. And so they, they get much more extensive. And uh, the, the urchins around the border of barrens um, are actually the reproductive ones. So they are the ones that are really important um, to keep, to limit the urchin populations. The ones in the middle, unfortunately, are, are often referred to as zombie urchins. It basically, they're starving because they've eaten themselves out of house and home. Um, and so it's really uh, the most important to get those ones around the edges that, that are um, reproducing. So we still have patchwork kelp um, they're here on the California coast with sea otters, but it's definitely a less dire situation than has been seen in Northern California. I know, which I think, I'll, you know, Rosa and Cindy, you guys mentioned in, in your presentation, you guys currently now have a pretty large urchin barren. Does it, do you have an idea of how much of expansive that is off of your, like, distance wise or sort of give an idea or? Um... Our, so the, the, the population that we are monitoring right now, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's this one little pocket um, and it's really heavily in the inner tidal, like when we have um, like a minus foot and a half to two foot, um, you can really, I mean, they're, they're just everywhere. They, it's, it's a carpet, really. Um, we've been trying to investigate with, with um, underwater drones to see how far into like the subtitle they, they go. Um, but I feel like a lot of ours are probably zombie urchins, um, which is just, a fun term that I had recently learned about an article. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of why we were wanting to do like the, uh, the drone kelp surveys. Cause there is like a little kelp forest right off, um, of this area. Um, there's a, a an offshore Island. That's a, a closed, um, uh, it's a special closure within the MPA network. Um, for it's a rookery for for birds and for sea lions and the spot is right in front of it um, and then in between that is like this little kelp forest so we're trying to kind of 
get a research model going so that we can um, monitor that and and hopefully maybe take some sort of control of it. But it's uh, and it's it's weird because it's just this little spot too. It's not that dense anywhere else that I found. So it's so interesting how that can happen, and that's why I think constantly having the funding to do these sort of um, projects and is, is really emphasizing that, that the research is needed and um, what you guys do is excellent. So thank you. Um, thank our you. next question is how many surrogate moms have there been? I think that goes to the aquarium. If, are they still with me? Oh, I may have lost them. Okay, guys, sorry. I, we went a little too long and, and I think they had to, they might have had a sea otter emergency that can happen with live streams. So I will get back to you on those questions. And then I think for right now, there was just lots of thank yous and shout outs to Alec for such an excellent um, presentation with visuals. Um, and I'm trying to go down really fast. There's so many more questions that are coming in. Um, thank you for the new location reporting. Um, oh, there was a question about how many otters are there now at San Nicolas Island? I know Joe isn't here, but maybe Jenna or Andy, do you guys have an estimate? Yeah, there's, there's around a hundred, a little over a hundred. So it's definitely increased. It was, it, the increase was pretty slow in the initial years following the translocation. And, um, but then in, in the last, I don't know, five years or more, uh, it really started to bump up. And now they're using more parts, uh, as Joe mentioned, of the island than they had previously. They're pretty much limited just to the southwest corner of the island for years. And then now they're spreading out and, and using more of it and, and doing really well. So every time we go out there, there's, there's a few more and they do get counted four times a year if possible. So um, every season a team goes out and counts them and tries to take a look at what they're, they're eating. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I see, so, so Chris W, I'll reach out to you. You can, we can have a long more detailed um, questions directed uh, to Sea Otter Savvy through our email. So I'll get back to you about that. And then we have a shout out to Laura in Alaska um, and that they wanted to say that they hiked and uh, hiked with you in Kodiak. So with that, I think we have most of them done for any of the follow-up questions I can go back through. I just want to say thank you guys all for joining us for this live stream. Live streams are fun. You never know what happens. And thank you to all the presenters. Um, it's amazing to be able to get everyone in, in at the same time <laughs> along this entire coastline. So um, big thank you, shout out, and um, we'll see you guys next year. All right. Bye yeah. everyone. I still.